Good morning from the First Baptist Church of Bullhead City, Arizona. Good to see you all today. It's a beautiful day in Bullhead City, January the 30th. And you know, I know the, the East Coast is buried in snow right now and everything, and it's going to be 72 degrees here today. Not that I'm rubbing it in for all you folks that are back East, but I guess I am, aren't I? Yeah, I am. Okay. Anyway, it's nice to see everybody today, and uh, we are going to have a birthday this coming week. We always celebrate our members with birthdays. And I don't see her here yet today, but uh, Doris, who's also going to have surgery next week, is going to have a birthday here in a couple of days, I think uh, Wednesday. And so if you don't mind, let's sing to, to Doris. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. clever for people's birthdays and last week I really blew it. I'm sorry about that Pauline. Last week I said that Pauline was going to be old enough to go buy liquor. <laughs> and and it was even worse than that and so I'm sorry I shouldn't have said that. I, I'm old and I do not filter very well okay. Okay she said don't worry about it. Anyway I just felt pretty foolish after that. Anyway, we're going to start this service with a word of prayer and a song. And if you wouldn't mind standing with me, we'll get rolling here. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your Holy Spirit who fills this place. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son who gives us salvation. We give you thanks for the plan that you have for each of us for our lives, Father. We give you thanks for the people who went before and left us this building to celebrate in and uh, we've been here for 50 years and going on beyond that. And Lord, we just are so blessed. You give us everything that we have and you ask for so little in return except for our love. And Father, we thank you and give you all of our honor, glory, and praise because you are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a song for you today and we got uh, Wayne working on the, the projector back in the back back here. We put him back to work. He hasn't done it in a couple of years, but he's already way ahead of me. So it sounds like this. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. somebody you know we used to shake hands and hug but we're being a little more careful these days I'm so glad
want to make sure that the folks out there on YouTube that are watching this uh, know there is actually a congregation in this building here because the, the camera shoots right up the aisle here. You can't see everybody. But speaking of YouTube, we're trying to get as many folks to sign up as we can because there's a little benefit coming to us if we can hit 100. And we're at almost 70 now. 69. 69, okay. So if we can just wow. push over there, they can give us some free advertising so we can put our name out there a little bit and maybe bring some more people to Jesus. Wouldn't that be great? So you can uh, subscribe. You can hit the little like button. That helps us. And then there's a, a send. Share. Share button. Okay, that was new to me last year. We can share our, our service with someone you like. Or as I said, with someone you don't like. Maybe they need to hear, see the service too. So uh, anyway, our YouTube ministry gets, uh, gets around the world. We've got people in Europe. We've got people in the Philippines. We've even got people in California. Go figure. Yeah. We so, have people in Russia who help the church. That's true. We've Which received... That's how the, the, uh, the stone got there got done? Yeah. That was from someone in Russia. Wow. We've received donations from Russia. Now, normally, uh, about this time, uh, uh, well, we're going to get into some more announcements and stuff here. But let's do the announcements first. First off, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we always have uh, services down here, Bible studies, prayer meetings, and all that. But with COVID flourishing so much, we decided to cancel that so that we're not in such close quarters with one another. We must have 15 people out today with COVID. You know, Stacy and Armando and Mickey and Joanne and Stan, Carol, Maureen, Dean, and the list even goes on beyond there. Carol and Rod, I mean, uh, Kay and Rod. So we want to make absolutely sure that, uh, that we're not spreading it. We don't want to be a super spreader here. So, uh, you know, if you want to wear your mask in the congregation, that's fine. Do that. And uh, we just want to make sure that everybody stays as safe as we can. Uh, if you've got COVID and uh, are staying home, if you're watching this on YouTube, please get a negative test before you come back because this is really tricky this year. It's, uh, it feels like a cold. I had it a couple of weeks ago and it feels like a mild cold, except, uh, you know, it just goes on and on and it's actually COVID and it's very contagious. So uh, get your negative test and, and that way we know that everybody's going to be okay around you. And uh, so we're just trying to be as careful as we can. Now we have a prayer list on the back of our uh, bulletin this morning, and there's lots of folks on it. The folks with uh, COVID, we've had some uh, bereavements here uh, in the in the church. Uh, my wife fell the other day, and uh, she's at home recovering. And so there's a lot of people, real people that you know, on the prayer list here. So we want to be sure that uh, when we do our praying, that we include our church family as well. So what did I forget? Nothing. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> We normally have some pictures from our Philippine ministry, but uh, my wife uh, buries them in the computer back there. She normally runs it. She stayed at home today because her hip hurts. And uh, I'm not going to ask Wayne to try to find that file on the computer somewhere, but we have some pictures of uh, some of the, uh, the goings on in the Philippines. We have a lot of children there who receive benefits from us because we send coloring books and crayons and pencils and clothes and shoes and Bibles. Anyway, so that's uh, kind of our... Uh, offshore ministry we kind of consider it our children's ministry because we really don't have any children here we're more retirees well we have one child okay we have one child who's now eight or nine months old his name is nathan the destroyer <laughs> no uh, we love nathan he's the coolest kid you ever saw in your life he's really cool and uh, stacy and armando uh, have nathan they're they're out with COVID. nathan has it too i think and so we're praying for them. You know, Nathan is the coolest guy. Anyway, uh, he was about three weeks old when I put my finger down there and he nearly tore it off. <laughs> Boy's got some muscles. Anyway, uh, pay attention to your prayer list. We won't do any uh, photographs today from the Philippines, but we're gonna go on with our music service, if that's all right with you. And we're gonna start with a song called, I Live. Because you're alive, because you're alive, because you're alive. 
Gods from the Hindu religion are not alive anymore, but Jesus Christ is alive. Is that right? Amen. Can I get amen? Amen. I thought I could. <clears throat> well, and he loves us. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you.
Morning, everybody. Morning. And everybody looking out for me this morning. I got cough drops and water and everything up here. And I'm probably still going to bark like a blue tick ham. Yes, guys, that is AC. Everybody knows it's coming. How's everybody this morning? Now, there's more than five people sitting out there. How is everybody this morning? Bless. Absolutely. So good to see each and every one of you. If you're here for the first time, hope you enjoyed the music so far. And I hope you enjoy what's coming because it's God's word, not mine. I would just as soon stand up here behind the curtain. Bob said, we're not going to buy drapes for you. I know. Sometimes there's a party pooper, isn't he? Seriously, folks, I see so much nowadays about people, people, people. And not just people as a whole, but me, me, me. If you don't think that's correct, go out there and drive. Did you know that each person owns the highway? The entire highway. You know? And that line that's in the center separating lanes, they think they're supposed to separate the hood on it. And the center lane, they drive in it, and they drive on this. Bob and I were in Kingman here a month or so ago, and a guy that I actually knew came flying up behind us, jumped up on the curb, and kept right on going. I was like, I know him. It's unbelievable. They think they're the only person in the world. Part of that is not accepting responsibility. We've been talking for quite a few weeks now about accepting responsibility. And... We talked about our souls are actually grieving for the loss of God. And that's why we search to buy cars and houses and diamonds and, you know, home shopping network at night. Mm -hmm. That's when you get that. Honey, why do we have a $3,000 credit card bill? Oops. Well, I was up late and couldn't sleep. Okay. From now on, no home shopping. I mean, you know, you, you get the kitty controls on the TV. You see the wives going out there, and they're sending the kitty controls. So at nighttime, the guys can't see anything to buy. We do that, seriously, out of, out of grief. Our souls grieve for God. And in grief, there are five stages. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Last couple of weeks, we've talked about denial. How we deny that we miss God from our lives. Last week we talked about anger. We get angry with God for mistakes that we make. And we justify it. We self-justify. We have to be able to self-justify it. I didn't do that. What we need to do every day, you need to start your day every day with the mirror test. Those of you who have been here before know what I'm talking about. Those of you who haven't, we'll explain it real quick. When you get up in the morning, walk into the bathroom, as you probably have to do, close the door. Don't let your wife, your puppy, your cat, your iguana, or anything else come in there. Stand in front of the mirror and just stand there. See if you can stand there for five minutes. I've never yet been able to do it. Because after the first 30, 40 seconds, you begin to see what God sees. You begin to see your true self. You begin to understand there was no reason to snap at that Walmart clerk. Believe me, she's got a bad enough job. I would not want that job. There was no reason to fuss at that person on the phone. There was no reason to hang up on your brother or sister because they had different political beliefs. Okay, let's agree to disagree. And let's move on because your politics, your aggravation, nothing in this world is as important as God, amen? amen. That's gotta be number one. It has to be. Part of accepting God is also accepting responsibility. We talked about when you're in denial, the first thing people do, politicians are the greatest at this. I can't remember the last time I saw a politician stand up and say, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Can't remember. Every time I watch one now, it's, this person did this. They're like two kids in the backseat of a station wagon. You know? Mommy, he bit me. He pulled my hair. You know, and I'm, I'm very serious. I'd like to bring them, everyone, regardless of political party up here, line them up and just give me a paddle. <laughs> Whack! 
Grow up. Stop acting like a small child and grow up. You know? You're being just childish. You're being irresponsible because you're blaming everybody else when in fact, you're angry at God. You're angry at yourself because your soul is grieving because of the loss of God from your life. And until you fill that hole, which can only be filled with him, you're going to continue to be angry and obstinate and hard-headed. And guys, I'm not accusing you. I'm accusing this one standing right here. Because if it's been done, I've probably done it. And if I haven't, I'm probably looking to do it sometime in the future. I am a sinner saved by God's grace alone. I come to God and said, God, I, I walk in there looking at me in the morning, and I said, hmm, I only thought there were 17 things, God. Now I understand there are 94. <laughs> and I apologize for them all. I repent. I can do better. You know, tomorrow, let's see if I can make it 93 or 92. I'm a work in progress, guys. We all are. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's talk about accepting responsibility. This is part five of the series. We have talked about several things leading up to it. Then we talked about denial. We talked about anger. This week, we talk about bargaining. How many have done this? How many of you have bargained with God? You're laying on a hospital bed. I've seen people do this. I've done this. Lay on a hospital bed and said, God, if you'll just get me out of here, I promise I'll do this, this, and this. You know? The problem with that is, guys, is that when you bargain, and nobody likes a bargain any more than I do, believe me. Some people in here, whatever, know, you know, I buy and sell things sometimes and stuff, and they're like, you ought to feel guilty about that. I don't. <laughs> I paid what the person wanted. I sold it for what the person was willing to pay. I don't feel bad about that. I do feel bad about my bargaining with God sometimes, all the time when I do it, because I know what's wrong. He's already given me the greatest deal. He gave me the gift of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then he raised him from the dead, giving us a victory over death. No more sting in death. Of death, where is that victory? Gone. Devil yeah, doesn't like that. We like to do a little devil stomping around here, so. You know, feel free. We do it all the time. So when we bargain, we say, well, I can do this, or I can do this. But remember, we think when we're doing it, we're the only ones that have ever done it. <laughs> I've got something new. Remember, Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. We humans are an odd lot. We're selfish, we're self-seeking, we're immature. And while we're doing this, bargaining with God. You got to understand God likes a good bargain too. So depending on motivation and his plans, he will give you additional benefits to what's already the deal of an eternal lifetime, not just a human lifetime. The deal of a century. Now this is a deal of an eternal lifetime. And he gave it to us. Every single one of us. We have an awesome God, don't we? More, more folks than that. Amen? Amen? We have an absolutely awesome God. So let's look at some biblical examples of bargaining. Because like I said, you're not the first one to do this. You may think you are. We always want to think we're better than what we are, or smarter than what we are. That's a human trait too. So we're going to look at Genesis 18, 23. Which says, then Abraham approached him and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Now, I encourage you to read all this chapter, which speaks of the three visitors of Abraham in verses 10 through 15. It speaks of the promise of a child for Sarah. What does Sarah do when she hears this? Sarah laughs. Of course, God asked Abraham, why does she laugh? And Sarah lies and says, I didn't, I didn't laugh. And God says, yes, you did. God will call you out, guys. Go and stand in front of that mirror in the morning, and I'm telling you, you'll feel it real quick. It'll be like, uh-oh. He's like that mama on the other side of that door that says, what are you doing? She already knows. She already knows. And you know that she knows. But you'll go back first to denial. Oh, no, I didn't do that. Then you'll go to anger. I'm so angry. I can't wait to grow up. You know, 
Best advice for 15, 16 year olds? Tell you what, go ahead, move out, conquer the world while you know everything. Oops. What do you mean I have to pay for food? Mama always gave it to me. The same mama you were fussing at on the other side of the door? I hate it, right? The same mama you lied to about what you did when she already knew what you did. When you went out that door, she knew what your intentions were. I know she's going to do this. Sorry, bud. I knew she was going to pat you on the shoulder. You're, you're the youngest one in here. You're going to get it. But, but if Miss Carol Selfridge was here, she'd be patting Renee on the shoulder, sir. We all get that. God gives us a wonderful deal, and yet we try to slide around it. So in 1823, here Abraham tries to bargain with God over the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You look how Abraham hedges his debt or negotiates with God. <laughs> he starts out, Genesis 18, 24 through 26, he says, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will they, would you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? This is Abraham speaking to God. I would be scared. I'd be ducking lightning bolts. The Lord says, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Now, this is a brave man, I'm telling you. I'm not that brave dealing with God. He's almost accusatory in his tone. Will you do this? You won't be justified. You're the great and powerful God. Now, I've done this in ignorance. Remember when I came from the Philippines? I was like, God says, time to move on. I said, but we're doing so many wonderful things. Well, that says, time to move on. And I said, but. So God kicked my butt and showed me what I was doing wrong. He made me go to those churches where we'd, we'd set up without the other pastors knowing. And I began to see. When I watched them without my presence being known, they were glowing and preaching and so much wonderful things were happening. And then I stepped out and it was like you dimmed the candle or dimmed the light. And I cried out to God and I said, forgive me. I was inhibiting their growth. It was time for me to move on. And then I said, well, where God? You guys are gonna laugh now. God said, Bullhead City, Arizona. I said, huh? <laughs> one stoplight, one gas station, and lots of burrows and coyotes. But I came here, I found the push first from God to move on, the pull to this area, because someone I hadn't heard from in a long time contacted me. I wound up here and almost it'll be four years of March I've been here. You guys kept me around that long. Isn't that scary? So I've done this, I did not quite what Abraham was doing, but I was saying, but 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 now, Abraham goes even further. Now, he's already got God at 50. But in the ensuing verses of whatever they come up here, all the way down to verse 1832, he says, then he said, my Lord, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10, and he doesn't do this 10, he does 40, then 30, then 20. Then he just keeps pushing. I mean, he's got a great deal already. But Abraham is keep pushing. Abraham's the guy you want with you when you buy a car, okay, or a house. So he says to God, may the Lord not be angry. We speak one. What if only 10 can be found there? God answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. But look at Abraham's motivation. He is praying for others. He's trying to save others. He's not saying save that city because I own three bars there. He's not saying save that city because I live there and I don't want you to burn my house. He's saying save these people. Our prayers are answered according to God's will. We sometimes forget that. Of course, 10 couldn't be found. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. We don't understand that sometimes. 
in our grief, our personal grief as well, as a grief of our absence from God, our personal grief, we've lost quite a few loved ones, as Bob mentioned this morning in the church lately, uh, family members, you know. And during that grief, it's hard not to be angry and not to deny it was the best thing. Yet, we know God's plan is best for our life. Amen? He's got a better plan, folks. A cough drop fell out, John. Sorry about that. He's got a better plan. Let's look at another part. Genesis 32, 24 through 29. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. Now, Miss Beth fell on Friday, and she is such a wonderful person, and she does so many wonderful things with the praise and worship team, and she does all the AV. And this was, I had this done by Tuesday. So I read this this morning, and I was like, wow, Lord. But anyway, let's go back to it. Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the side of Jacob's hip. So his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. Jacob is wrestling with God's messenger. Not only does he wrestle with God's messenger, Jacob wants a deal. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Okay. So you're going to choke me until I bless you. I, I can't speak. You know? He's wrestling with God's messenger. They, I tell you, these were some, some brave guys, Bob. I mean, seriously brave. I have talked back to God. Yes, I admit it. I have said why when you shouldn't say why. You know, but these men, this individual is wrestling with God's messenger. And then he wants a deal. He wants a deal. But the man blesses him. He does. He does, in fact, bless him. And in, when, I, when I look at this and I think about it, I think about 3230, Jacob called the place where this happened, Peniel saying it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. How often do we bargain with God for a blessing? How often? How often do we say, God, if you'll do this, I'll do this. But in doing that, we forget to say, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for me not being sick. Thank you that I have food to eat. Thank you that I have a car to drive. Thank you that I have a roof over my head and it doesn't leak. We forget about all those things because the first thing in the top of our mind is our wants rather than our needs. And remember, God doesn't always give you what you want, but he always provides what you need. Amen? So many times, over and over, we do that. And we keep this bargaining thing keep up with this bargaining thing all the time. It's just, it's so weird. Now, who could forget this part of it? 1 Samuel 1, 19 through 20. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, then went back to their home. And Ramah, Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She called him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. In verses 1 through 18 here, we read of how Hannah was teased, abused, and provoked by her rival. Yet Hannah didn't fight back. Hannah had a godly response. What did Hannah do? She prayed. She didn't suffer her on the head. She said, no, I'll pray. She went to God. She prayed so much, she was thought drunk. Remember? Read 1 through 18. They thought she was drunk. She played with such fervor. And unlike some, she kept her bargain with God. My son Samuel will be God's, totally God's. As soon as he was weaned, messenger of God, 
She kept her word. How often do we? How often do we keep our word with God? How often do we say, God, if you'll do this or did this, or do we forget as soon as the sun shines? <laughs> Remember, too, we bargain with God out of grief that he is not in our lives, and yet we can't explain that we want this show of power from God, we want this blessing to prove to us that he's there, and with our heart we know he's there, amen? We know he's there. We know he blesses us every day. We're like that, that kid that needs that reassurance all the time. You know? And believe me, some of those kids are 65, 70, and 80 years old. How many of you have a friend that no matter how many times you talk to that person, they'll say, oh, well, are you sure? Can you come over and do this? Yeah. Oh, are you sure? I said I would, didn't I? You know? I'm not real pastoral sometimes or whatever when people ask me silly questions. Bob will, Bob will get on me sometimes. So will some other people. And I'll apologize and say, okay. I'll think in the back of my mind or whatever, you know, you really shouldn't ask that silly question. And the next morning in the mirror, I have to repent for that. See, so it costs me all the way around. Doesn't even help me. It does. I wind up paying a price for it. But you know what? That person needs an assurance. We as humans need it. That's why we ask for additional blessings. Our souls are grieving for the loss of God from our life. And yet, what do we want? I want a blessing to prove God's here. Well, you know he's here. The problem is you're not letting him 100%. That's your 60% Christian and your 70% Christian. Well, I'm a good Christian most of the time. No. Is he a good God most of the time or all of the time? Okay. Then why are the scales not balanced? Well, I can't, I, can't, I can't give that much of myself to God because I like to have fun. Being a Christian is fun, guys. I'm telling you. It's a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun all the time. I do. People think there's something wrong with me. Maybe there is. He's got it. I don't worry about it. He takes care of me. We continue to bargain for his presence. How many of you remember Job crying out to God in resentment? What have you done, Lord? Blah, 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 blah. These, these people that you've sent. But look at Job. First, 42.6. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job finally realizes I'm raving against God when I'm the problem. I am the problem. All these things that beset me. Remember, guys, when you go through trials, consider it pure joy. Consider it joy. If I'm taking the strike for God, I'm doing a good job. If the devil knocks me down, I get back up, I'm doing a good job. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, everybody nowadays, big thing is bucket list. Remember the movie a few years ago? I want to go here and I want to go here. I've had been fortunate to go all around the world. I've done just like everything that I've ever wanted to do in life. But I have one thing I want before I die, when I die. At the point at which I die, uh, federal law enforcement has the most wanted list. Local law enforcement has one. State law enforcement has one. I want to be number one on the devil's most wanted list. I want him to have a big poster on his wall. Wanted. So that when I can die, I can look at him and say, he, 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 <laughs> didn't get me, bud, and go on. I want to aggravate him, tease him, anger him, make him so mad he wants to come fight. I want him to do that. And that's not going to be easy, folks. There are times when I get knocked down. A few weeks ago, crack right there. Bob thought I broke a board. See, I'm getting heavier, see. Bob thought I broke a board. There was a hip popping out of joint. <laughs> I was like, Bob, <laughs> what was that noise? He probably thought, mm hmm. I told him to stop eating all those donuts. <laughs> but God made a way that day. The person who put the hip back in joint was already on her way here from Las Vegas. Before the injury, you said it this morning when we were praying, before I was injured, she was already on the way. Don't tell me God's plans aren't better. I am, I am witnessing to it all the time. 
She was already on her way. Got here, took care of it, boom. Got it checked, no problem, all good. Praise God. He takes care of us, and we don't need to bargain with him. We bargain with him because we miss him. Doesn't that sound a little silly? I miss you, but I'm going to strike a bargain with you. Try that with your wife or husband. I can hear it now. Have you lost your mind? Did you not take your medicine this morning? No. Your puppies would look at you funny, Mr. Sue. Back up. Then you know you're in trouble. Becca heard me on the phone the other day and continually barked until I said, Becca, I'll come see you soon. And then Becca got quiet. She's bargaining. She's got this thing worked out too, see? She's got it all worked out. Folks, the bottom line is that we miss God so much from our lives that we do everything we can to get him back there, but not really. We're not doing it 100%. We're doing it halfway. How many of you like a job done halfway? I don't see a single hand. The guy that comes and builds that garage and doesn't put a door on is not going to get paid, is he? No. Nope. But your God, your God 100% of the time, and all he wants is 100% of your love, and yet you don't give it to him. Why not? Don't talk to me about it. Talk to God. Your relationship with God is individual. If you need to talk with me about counseling in the Bible, I will give you biblical counseling. I do not offer Christian counseling. Because Christian counseling can be covered by doctrine or man's opinion. If it's not in that Bible, I won't say it to you. Period. Period. And no one should say it to you. Because at the point at which they try to counsel you from their experiences in life, from anything else they've read other than the Bible, then you're getting opinion. And guess what, guys? You're all individual. Even if you have a twin, you're an individual. I'll guarantee you there's something different between you and your twin. That individual relationship has to be with you and God alone. If you're in a relationship with someone else, God's got to be at the center of it. If it's not, believe me, it's not love and it's not going to work. God's got to be at the center of it. All the time. The answer is God. I can't put it any simpler. And when we do for others, it shows continue looking at Job here and you look at Job 42.10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Ah. Job didn't pray, Lord, heal me, fix this, boom, boom. He'd already been ranting and raving to God. And finally he said, I'm sorry, it's all me. But he added something. Something we forget to add. He prayed for his friends. 42.10 says, After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. He gave it twice as much as he had before. What's missing in this world is intercessory prayer. We pray for all the things we want. We bargain for all the things we want. We don't ask for our brothers and sisters. We don't ask for those who don't have. It is an important element of believers that's been forgotten, and it's been overlooked, and I seldom ever hear it. I don't even watch pastors on TV anymore because I know what I'm going to hear. Feel good. Everything's great. What about hell and sin and responsibility? Because as surely as there are heaven, there's a hell. And if you stand up here and don't preach about it on holy ground, God sees you, believe me. And you as an individual are going to have to deal with that. And it's no different. Folks, we're all Christians. We're all, we're all given the Great Commission. Spread the word of God. Witness to his goodness. Talk about what he's done in your life. Show people through the way you live your life. Don't tell them. You don't have to tell people you're a Christian. They can look at you. They won't just say, that person was a good person. They'll say, that person knows God. Amen. Intercessory prayer is so important, along with thy will, God's will. We get so involved with us, we forget what God wants. He wants us, yet we grieve at his absence while not letting him in. Isn't there something wrong with that? 
We struggle with trials because we don't turn it loose and let God handle it. We cry to blues about what he doesn't do, yet we fail to thank him for all he does. We are, in fact, the royal pain, okay? We really are. Human beings are not, not a good deal for God, and yet he loves us and takes us anyway, okay? You know? He's that, he's that, we are that used car to God that was only driven by a school teacher back and forth to church on Sunday. She walked to school, you know, has 374,000 miles on it that's been rolled off, you know. It's got banana peels in the rear end and sawdust in the transmission, but don't worry about it. That's what we are. Human beings are not a bargain, folks. We're not. Does he need us? No. Does he want us? Yeah. Why? Because he loves us. Period. We are no bargains. Not at all. And I know he didn't get a bargain in me. I look up all the time and say, you bless me again? I don't know why, but I love you. I really do do that, guys, all the time. Because I get blessed all the time, and I don't know why. I've never done anything to deserve the blessings he gave me. I have gone through some hellacious trials in my life. And yet he brought me out every time, every single time he's brought me through. So to stand up here is a privilege. It is a privilege to serve God. It's not a job, not an occupation. It's a calling and it's a privilege. But you're called to do it too. Every single one of you who knows God, has God in your heart, you are called to witness to his goodness. You are called to testify to the things in your life that have gone on because you have God. Amen? Amen. The greatest gift of all time. You've got the best bargain, guys. You have the best bargain. Pop de Leon searched all his life for the fountain of youth. Eternal life. Right there. His word. His promises fulfilled. All the time. He's never failed to fulfill a promise. Never. How many of you have made a rash offer in a tight situation? I'll do anything. Watch your words. I call those anti-atheist moments. Let me explain that. It's very simple. A person in a gunfight will promise anything, offer anything, and do almost anything to get out of the lot. There is no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. How many veterans do we have in here? Put your hands up. No such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. There's no such thing, I'm, I'm retired law enforcement also, there's no such thing as an atheist in a gunfight. I'm going to tell you that right now. When you get in one and the bullets start flying, the first thing you call, you don't call out, you know, I always wondered about, about atheists. You who doesn't exist? <laughs> Can you give me a hand? They don't say that. They don't say that. They will sit around cursing and, and, and acting like idiots. And they get in that gunfight over. God help me. Who? I don't think you know him, do you? Shut up. <laughs> I've done that, guys. I've done it. I've hollered at people and said, I didn't think you believed in him. Would you shut up? Laugh at him afterwards. That's not funny. We could have died. If I die, I go to heaven. Where are you going? Ooh, that's a perfect moment to witness, guys. I'm telling you. They are real receptive at that moment. Anybody know why? <laughs> I mean, they're just really, really receptive then. They want to hear anything you got to say. No such thing. But we have to watch what we do as far as the promises, if we do try to bargain with God. You must be careful doing this with God. More importantly, you must remember that God gives pardons for mistake. Jephthah, the Galadite, made such a mistake. Judges 11, 30 through 31. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, if you give the Ammonites into my hands, Whatever, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return and triumph on the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Jephthah made that promise. He wanted to win so much. He was so determined to win. He never thought of the consequences. He never accepted responsibility. In this world today, we have no consequences. Just saw with a 
where the uh, new attorney general for New York no longer wants uh, life sentences thought in these situations. If a gun, this is, this is documented, if a gun is used and someone is shot, if that person is not seriously injured, he does not want an arrest, he does not want the people charged. And they just had a police officer killed, by the way. So I'm wondering what he's going to do about that. That's just absolutely ridiculous. I'm not making a political statement. I'm making a human statement. Period. That's not right according to God. Period. We make all these wonderful deals and we say we're going to do this. Jephthah, whoever comes out that door, they're yours, Lord. I'm going to make a sacrifice. How quick does accepting responsibility come back? It comes back in ways you would never expect. Judges 11, 34 through 40. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mitzvah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, no, my daughter, you have brought me down, and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he answered. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father and did to her, he did to her as he had vowed. And she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young woman of Israel go up for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. A rash bargain. Done in haste because of what they wanted. He wanted this. He wanted this. Now, you have to be careful what you offer when you're bargaining with God. And that bargain is only going to be fulfilled according to his will. But I think on a little different lines on this. I have had many spirited discussions, which is code for arguments, <laughs> with theologians about this. Because I think along, like I said, a little different lines. Genesis 21. God fulfills his promise to Sarah and gives her an Abraham at 100, his son. Yet in chapter 22, he asks for that son as a sacrifice. Genesis 22, 2, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Yet as Abraham prepares to do as God commands, Genesis 22, 10 through 12, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now this argument is repelled by people saying, well, it was God's will that Jephthah kill his daughter. I'm going to argue that. I'm going to argue, what if Jephthah had prayed? You can read that chapter over and over, and I'm telling you, there's nothing in there that ever tells you her name, and it never tells you that Jephthah prayed. What if he had said, God, I made a bad bargain? What kept him from doing that? Think about that. What keeps us from going to God frequently? It's the number one thing. Oh, I just saw it on someone's lips. P-R-I-D-E. Because then we have to admit, help me out, church, that we are W-R-O-N-G. And it's not easy to say you're wrong. I tell you, let's try something. Look at the person next to you and say, I was wrong. Come on, Kenny. Thank you. I'm not going to let anybody get away with that. I was wrong. How hard was that? Did any teeth drop out of your head? Did you get a severe headache or a nosebleed? No, it's merely a word. But how hard is it to say? Honey, take out the trash. I will after the football game. Next morning, 
you hear her out there struggling. And you know, whether you're in the bathroom or whether you're getting your coffee or what, you know you're in trouble. Why? Because you were wrong, right? Absolutely. Now, if you're smart, you'll say, honey, don't worry about breakfast. We'll go to Denny's or we'll go here, we'll go here. And you'll smooth it over. But you know you were wrong. You know you were. How about walking in there and looking at her now and saying, I was wrong. Would it help if I cooked breakfast? Ah. Might get you in a, might get you a little better graces. I don't know. I don't know. Folks, my point is, it's so hard to say I was wrong, and it shouldn't be. I was wrong. I'm wrong all the time. I'm wrong more often than I'm right. I was right the other day about something in, in praise and worship practice, and I wanted to call it a notary public so that we could document it. It's rare. My God knows I'm wrong. When I go stand in front of that mirror, look at him in the morning, I think they're 92. And I hear this voice, you better count again. 192? No. It's, it, it, it is something that if you do it every day, you'll begin to see how you can change your life. You'll begin to see how you can change it. Because if you change one little thing, okay, no matter the fact that I went through that drive through and my bill was $10.10, $9.10, and I gave the girl $10.10, and she handed me back $0.90, cent. I'm not going to complain. <laughs> Come on, we've all had that happen. You build $9.10, you give her $10 on a dime, you're going to get $0.90 cent back, <laughs> because the cash register said that. It's going to happen. So I don't even bother giving a dime anymore. At least I've still got a dollar when she gives me the 90 cent, you know? <laughs> we don't have the level of intelligence in this world we once had. I don't care what anyone says. Common sense is no longer common. We will lose our temper over. We will get angry. The thing to do is try not to do it as much. And when you stand in that bathroom in that morning, you look in that mirror, admit you did it. I was wrong, God. I was wrong. I didn't have to growl at that person. You know? How many in here in the public service industry, in one way or another, how many have to deal with the public? Okay. I pray for you all the time. Believe me. Everyone out there is entitled. Everyone you meet is entitled. Some more so than others. And customer service is a thing of the past. They're going to tell you that 900 times in one day. But how do we approach that person who gives us customer service? Do we approach it saying, okay, <laughs> ah, how are you? I'll tell you, you walk in the bank, I walk in my bank, and all the girls know me by name now, because I walk in, hi, how are you doing today? What can we help you with? The real great business life. What can we help you with? Oh, this, this, and this. And then when you leave, they'll say, can I do anything else for you? Yeah. Okay. Have a nice day. Walk away. It doesn't take but a moment, guys. All it takes is a moment. You can brighten someone else's day. After a while, you begin to see them smile. I mean, some people have faces. I don't think they're made to smile. I mean, I saw concrete cracks on one lady's, but eventually they went away. You know? You can make someone's day. Why not do it? Why not? It makes you feel better. You're walking out there whistling. Doo -doo 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 -doo. People think you've got a million dollars. You've got $7.91 in the bank, but you're still happy. I'm happy because I got my guy. I'm not worried about the bargain of the money. I'm not worried about the cars or the jewels or the airplanes or the trains. I'm worried about my relationship with God, my individual relationship with God that tells me I have that blessed assurance. Amen? I have it, and I know it, and I don't worry about it. I don't know if God would have released Jephthah from his deal, but I know he didn't ask. How many of you even here have ever prayed with Miss Beth? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Miss Beth has a saying that I absolutely love. She says, 
every single time she prays. It comes from James 4, 2. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask from God. She will add that to every single prayer every time. You pray whether you know it. And I love it. Because we don't have because we don't ask. Amen? Amen. We have that hole in our heart. And we're grieving. And we're going through the stages of grief. Deny or angle, not bargaining. All because we don't say, take me God. Take me God. So simple. I was wrong. Take me God. Take me now, Lord. I'm ready. Thy will be done. It's one of the main elements of any prayer. Thy will be done. Don't pray for the things you want in this world. Pray for the things for your brother and sister that doesn't have. And pray everything. Thy will be done. Thy will be done, folks. His will, not ours. He's got a better plan. It works out better when he fixes it. And it works out every single time. When you pray, remember, this is the way we should pray. Join in with me, guys. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thy will be done. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God's will is not being done here on earth. This is not God's will. We say, why won't God fix COVID? Why won't God, why is there so much hatred in the world? Why, 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 why? You're talking as if you know God. Well, God's supposed to be so great and wonderful. Well, if you're saying he's supposed to be so great and wonderful, you obviously don't know God. Let's talk about it and get to know him. See what a difference it can make in your life. You have, you have to start for me to interrupt. <laughs> well, I'm going to start, and then he's going to interrupt if he just said so. <clears throat> Let's wait and see how this works out. We have a song called Give Thanks. So when you've made your bargain and you receive your blessing, give thanks with a grateful heart. Sing this with me here. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. If you are weak, you can become strong. If you are heavy laden in your heart, you can feel better. If you have stress, you can be de-stressed. If you don't know God, you're sitting in the sanctuary now, come on down front. Let's pray a prayer. Let's get that straight between you and God. It's very simple. Shall we pray? Precious Heavenly Father, I come to you now. I thank you for the things in my life. And Father, I don't know you, and I want a personal relationship with you, and I want it right now. I give myself to you. I give all the burdens and cares of my heart to you. Father, take me now. I say with my mouth that I am a sinner, and I say with my heart 
that I accept Jesus Christ because he died for me on the cross, was raised again, that victory over death can be mine. Take me, God. Take me now. Amen. Pray that prayer and mean it. If you have other prayers, if you have cares on your heart, come down here right now. Let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. It's not going to work if you don't go to God with it because man doesn't have the answer. God does. Give thanks. Give thanks for the fact that he's in our lives. Amen? Amen. He's here. He's ready. He's available. Come on, guys. Everybody on TV, all the flashing lights across the river, they all promise one thing, a great deal. We got the greatest deal right there on that cross. When he died, when he rose again, there was a victory over death, and it's available to you. If you want it, come pray about it. If you're out there on YouTube, land, Bob said, like, share, subscribe, do all that. Yeah, that's great. But if you're out there in YouTube land, you don't have heart, God in your heart, take it now. It's time, folks. It's time. You might not have tomorrow. You aren't promised tomorrow. And after God touches your heart, remember to give thanks. Be thankful. How much do we love our God? More than anything. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. We love our God. And we give Him thanks. Before you give Him thanks, give Him your heart. Brother Bob? That's right. <clears throat> and now, let the weak say, I am. everything to us that we have and ask so little in return. Father, all we have to give you is our hearts and our love. And Father, we do that today. We know that you are watching over us. We know that you take care of us. And we know that you have a plan and that we're part of it. And we are included and we give you thanks in all the things that you do. So Father, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You take it easy out there. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you next week.